Hello there! I knew you'd be coming. I'm a psychologist. My name is Eric Erickson. You may know me from my revolutionary work regarding human psychosocial development, or because of my funny name. For the last uh, 91 years or so, I've been perfecting my theory of psychosocial personality development. The concept that as a person grows, they advance through a series of eight stages of inner conflict that correspond with the new challenges that face them in each phase of their life. The idea first came to me as I was relaxing on a lovely winter morning under my favorite apple tree. Oh. Eight-stage theory of psychosocial personality development? Today, I'm going to take you on a journey through these eight stages I have identified. We will observe the challenges each individual must overcome in the different stages of their life, as well as the lasting effect each inner crisis has on their personality going forward. I think we will learn a lot, and I hope that we'll have a bit of fun while we're at it too. Come, come. Uh, this way, uh, to the psychology. Shh, the baby is sleeping. The first stage of my theory is trust versus mistrust. This first crisis is a simple one because, like, come on, it's a baby. It can't even burp itself, much less undertake an introspective psychological journey. In this stage, which spans from zero to two years of age, the newborn child must learn whether or not this world can be depended on. It looks to its parents as the only source of food, warmth, comfort, safety, and love. Once it realizes that this world is safe and dependable, the child learns trust and is set to develop in a normal and healthy way. However, if the child's caregivers fail to provide for its basic needs, it may develop feelings of mistrust that bury themselves in the psyche for years to come. But do not fret! Even if the child has a rough first couple of years, the outcome of this stage, like any of my eight stages, is not permanent. If they are given proper care and emotional support, they will likely turn out just fine. The second stage of my theory is autonomy versus shame and doubt. Taking place from ages two to four, this is generally the stage in which the child uses its newly developed mental faculties and motor abilities to learn as much as they can about the world they live in. They no longer rely on their parents to do everything for them and quickly learn how to perform certain tasks for themselves, such as feeding themselves, dressing themselves, using the toilet, doing their taxes, charting the orbits of nearby satellites, staying involved in local government, and brushing their own teeth. If the child is faced with tasks of appropriate difficulty and receives proper support from their caregiver, they will develop a healthy sense of self-sufficiency. But if the tasks they are given are too difficult for them to overcome, or they are not allowed to perform the tasks they are easily capable of, the child may develop feelings of shame and doubt about their ability to be independent. Stage 3, Initiative versus Guilt, is all about the child beginning to make their own choices and plans, taking a bigger portion of their lives into their own hands. This crisis occurs as the child gets used to wielding this new power. They undertake tasks of their own choosing just to stay active and keep learning, developing personal interests along the way. Children need to be assured that these activities are in fact acceptable uses of their time, or they may develop feelings of guilt about wanting to do them. Wow! Great job there, buddy! The next stage takes place as the child heads off to school. Industry versus inferiority. This is a completely new environment. Instead of having to master the skills of the world through play and exploration, 
they are judged by their productivity. If all goes well, this is a great opportunity for the child to feel good about their skills and learn to put work before pleasure. However, if they are not able to quickly master new skills and keep up with their peers, they may develop low self-confidence and feelings of inferiority. Stage 5 is identity versus role confusion, taking place throughout the teenage years. As the child makes the transition into adulthood, they wrestle with the question, who am I? They seek to determine how they will fit into society, whether it be an occupation, reputation, or religious or political views. Now, here I have managed to track down a real teenager. Let's see if we can get her perspective on the adolescent identity crisis. Hello? My name is Eric Erickson. Would you like to talk about the changes you are going through? Get out of my house! Oh, oh wow. <laughs> Sounds like some real good uh, psychosocial development going on there. <laughs> let's, let's just go. Stage six is intimacy versus isolation. If the person has matured well and successfully settled the five other conflicts, they may be ready for a long-term intimate relationship. Love is an important ingredient for a happy life, but if the person has failed to develop their identity or how to relate to others, they may push others away and fade into isolation. <laughs> That's it, boy. Learn to Stage 7 stretches from middle to late adulthood. Generativity versus stagnation. This stage is all about working for the good of the next generation. Instead of settling into a rut and allowing your life to go nowhere, doing something good with your life is a way to boost overall life satisfaction. For some people, this may mean guiding your children as they grow into adults, or taking care of your parents as they continue to age, or strengthening your relationship with your spouse. For me, my life's work is, is this video. <laughs> oh. Hello? Any of you need like a mentor? Someone to guide you in this crazy mess we call life? Uh, I'm very qualified, I'm a psychologist. Please? Please? We've arrived at the final stage of my theory. Integrity versus despair. In these last few years of a person's life, their developmental task is to look back on their life and feel satisfied about what they have accomplished and experienced. If they feel that they have failed in getting what they want out of life, they may fall into despair. Now I have a surprise for you. I have a very special guest here to reflect on the things he has accomplished during his lifetime. I'm willing to bet that his accomplishments have affected each and every one of you in some way, whether it be through his movies, his memoirs, or just because he has saved modern civilization as we know it. Allow me to introduce the man who needs no introduction, famed Hollywood star, award-winning author, and Astro Spy, Sir Russell Backflip. Hey, how are you doing? I'm developing nicely, thank you. Thank you so much for allowing me to interview you. Oh, no problem. No problem whatsoever. Please, don't worry about it a second more. Yes, well, uh, okay. What would you say is the greatest thing you've ever accomplished? Great question, Derek, but I don't think it's for me to say. If you were to, say, walk up to your average Joe on the street, he'd probably rave about my 14 communist satellite takedowns back in my covert astronaut years. Personally, I would say my greatest accomplishment was marrying my beautiful wife Shannon and raising our six biological and three adopted children together. My children comprise 1.3% of the United States Congress and 25% of the Clarkson, Nevada Board of Education. I'm proud of every single one of them. That's great, uh... How would you say you feel about- Never interrupt Russell Backflip. 
I, of course, starred in, directed, and scored my movie Never Rest on Everest, a dramatization of the time I scaled Mount Everest to bring vaccines and homemade chocolate chip cookies to the orphanage on top of the mountain. <coughs> I can't stop now! Those polio-stricken, starving orphans are going to freeze to death! So that was something. I discovered and named a new species of snake during the year I spent trying to reforest the Amazon. I named it Harvey, after the child with cancer I visited as part of my work with the Make-A-Wish Foundation. I am proud to say that Harvey beat cancer and is now Lieutenant Commander of the Twilight Squadron of SEAL Team 6. That's the secret squadron, by the way, so don't tell anybody about that. How did that even- Of course, NASA asked me to come out of retirement back in 1987. Apparently some secret society had managed to launch a few unauthorized military satellites and were raising a bit of a fuss. Well, after a week or so of training, space travel is just like riding a bike, you know, I managed to blow those suckers to Kingdom Come and parachute down to Sherwood Content, Jamaica, just in time for my godson's baptism. Oh, you might have heard of him, uh, Usain Bolt. Your godson is- And I've been staying busy, too. Just last week, I was visiting my son Jack in D.C. Managed to avert World War III by jamming our nuclear launch mechanism with my, uh, Nobel Peace Prize. So, yeah, I'd say my life turned out pretty good. Well, th thank you very much, Mr. Backflip. You know, all of this has made me think back on my own life. I suppose I'm in stage eight, too. I have so many questions that keep running through my mind. Have I done everything I set out to do? What will I be remembered for? At last, my life's work is complete. Eric? Eric? <laughs>